In Orange County, California, Hemapet services 2,000 veterinary clinics around the nation, but the blood is sourced from Hemapet's colony of caged and abused dogs. What a PETA eyewitness investigation found next on the PETA podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, a dog blood bank expose, how Hemopet cruelly sucks the life out of dogs. A huge number of the population that we saw there had extensive hair loss, had these bulging pockets of water on their elbows, um, had irritation and, and very red, raw-looking skin, um, a lot of mobility problems. You know, very subtle suffering, very subtle cruelty, but very pervasive and endemic. And day in and day out, this was the reality. Dan Payton, PETA's Director of Evidence Analysis, describes the facility at Hemapet in Orange County, California, where retired greyhounds are kept in cramped cages and become sickly. It doesn't stop Hemapet from drawing blood for profit in two-week cycles for up to two years per dog. A PETA eyewitness discovered it's no way to treat a retired greyhound. But first, thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast. Please share a link with your friends. Let them know that the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, binge away. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, Donate to PETA. And now to our episode. After no longer being useful at the dog tracks, greyhounds are left longing for a home. But when they get rescued by Hemapet, it's a curse. Here's my conversation with Dan Payton about what PETA eyewitnesses discovered at Hemapet in California and what it might mean for you and your dog and your vet on the PETA podcast. This is a new expose of a facility called Hemopet, uh, which is a dog blood bank uh, just outside Los Angeles. And uh, this case revealed that this is uh, a so-called rescue. It's a, it's a sham. It's a nonprofit. And it warehouses about 200 greyhounds, uh, most if not all of whom have been bred for and discarded by the racing industry. And it keeps them in tiny crates and rusty kennels for roughly 23 hours out of every single day solely for the purpose of taking these dogs blood and then selling it to 2,000 or so veterinary clinics across North America and even uh, in Asia. And this is a, a regular thing. I, I mean, people know about blood banks and about donating blood, but yeah. if you go to a vet and your your dog may need some blood. This is usually a source where where the vets get their blood. And is all dog blood? I mean, from a greyhound, does it go to any dog? Or is, is there a blood type that uh, that they check? Yeah. So so that's exactly why this particular breed, unfortunately, is the the type of dog who ends up captive and frankly quite miserable in these facilities. Um. The greyhound's blood type, so to speak, is the closest thing to a universal blood type, if you will, in the canine world. And so last year, we worked with a, a man, a very brave man in Texas, who worked at a very similar facility. And he blew the whistle on the cruelty he saw there. And we worked with the Washington Post and exposed the neglect of 151 greyhounds at that facility. And after several weeks of hard campaigning and pressure brought to bear, um, that facility shut down and those dogs were released to uh, adoptive agencies. 
So here we're at 200 dogs, um, very similar situation where, you know, cast off by the racing industry, hauled in some cases from Florida all the way to Southern California and locked up and cooped and denied everything that's important and natural to them. And yes, when, when, unfortunately, when dogs are uh, in critical condition and whether that's the car accident or some kind of a blood disease and they're in need of blood products and they go to an emergency clinic for a transfusion and other care. Um, what we're finding is that many veterinarians are unknowingly supporting cruelty to some dogs in a blood bank for the sake of trying to help uh, another dog who is, of course, equally deserving of love and a home, as is <laughs> the so-called donor locked away, you know, on the other side of the country. Now, is this true with all dog blood banks, or is this just true with this one in particular, or it, it, does it appear to be a standard for um, entrepreneurs who see that these greyhounds are being abandoned, they take them, and then they sell the blood? Is this no, a pattern? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's, there's really, there's actually two, uh, there's actually two very divergent ways of, of approaching how you source canine blood to help animals in need. So you have on the one hand facilities like Hemopat, this captive colony idea where you have these discarded greyhounds in most cases, and you are keeping them locked up, cooped up, um, for hours and hours for, 18 months, maybe 20, 24 months, and taking blood out of them every 10 to 14 days, essentially reducing them to, you know, a blood bag on four legs. Um, mm. The alternative, and which is very viable and which is growing, and I think people are, especially in the veterinary community, becoming more aware of and siding more with, is a community-operated blood bank. I mean, almost a Red Cross for dogs, in essence, where... Mm. You know, people who have greyhounds or other large breed dogs at home who are calm, who do not mind going to the veterinarian, um, who curl up at their family's feet every night and are loved, are then brought into a veterinary clinic or even to a mobile blood bank and have their blood withdrawn periodically, maybe every three months, every four months, something like that. Um are given a checkup, are given veterinary care while they're there, typically for free as a way of saying thank you. And then they go home with their family at night. And so the challenge for PETA and for good people is to try to shift this industry and veterinarians' awareness of it from the captive model where animals are suffering to the community blood bank model where animals have the homes they need and are still helping save the lives of, of other dogs in need. Yeah, I'm because I'm sure a lot of people aren't they they don't really understand this until you know they're faced with a situation where a dog needs a transfusion and where do they get it? And the vet says we gotta go to a blood supply place. But a community source would seem to be the most humane and certainly be the better course, but how practical is that? And uh, it sounds like this is an op entrepreneurial opportunity for someone. Unfortunately, it also is an opportunity for cruelty. So it's kind of complicated, this issue, huh? It is. It is. And, and I, I honestly, I mean, I, I veterinarians are busy people. I mean, um, anyone who's gone to a clinic, you know, can, can see that, um, you know, these individuals don't have a lot of spare time on their hands. We've consulted with some really prominent veterinarians in the United States and, and elsewhere. And they've told us, and, and you know, the UK and Europe in, in particular have moved in this direction, away from the captive colony and towards veterinarians developing relationships with their human clients, with the dog guardians, to say, hey, look, uh, you know, if I have a dog come in one afternoon at 4 p.m. and this dog needs a transfusion, can I have you on my list of people to call? You could bring your dog in. And again, you know, you'll, you'll get a free checkup. Um, we'll take wonderful care of their dog, obviously. And we'll take, you know, 10 fluid ounces of, 
of blood from your dog so that we can help save your neighbor's dog life. Um, we're assured that it's, it's, it's very plausible. In fact, veterinary schools in many cases are running operations like this. North Carolina mm-hmm. State does this. Uh, University of California at Davis runs a very successful uh, community dog blood bank. The University of Pennsylvania uh, has operated for many years a mobile blood bank um, that makes it more convenient, almost like we do for our spay-neuter clinics at PETA, makes it more convenient for people to help animals by bringing that service or that you know request right to their community. And yet, because it sounds like this company is doing a good thing by providing blood. And on top of that, they're Hemopet, this company that, uh, that was exposed in this uh, in investigation that you did through the Associated Press. Hemopet is a nonprofit organization that says it rescues dogs. So I suppose as long as there's this profit motive, entrepreneurs will try to go right up to the line and maybe go over that line you know, in terms of cruelty and abuse, uh, you know, in the name of profit and something has to be done is, does anyone regulate something like a hemopet, the nonprofit organization that says it rescues dogs and then does this, you know, does their business in a way that is really inhumane to the dogs? Yeah. So there, there is no federal regulation of of animal blood banks whatsoever, not under the Animal Welfare Act or any other regulation right now. Uh, that's something that we're setting out to change. Um, mm. California, in fact, is the only state in the union that does regulate these facilities. Um, it has for several years. It licenses two operations in California. Um, it establishes very minimal um, baseline regulations for the housing and care uh, of dogs. Um, Interestingly enough, when the regulations became law in California, uh, there also was attached there an exemption for all records of the enforcement of those laws from requests for public records. So the extent to which the state of California is regulating and what they're finding at these facilities is not something that the public can see. People who live in California who pay the salaries of the staff charged with inspecting these facilities are not able to determine how these animals are being tended to were it not for, in this instance, a key to eyewitness investigation. Tell me more about the dogs and tell me more about how they got to Hemopet there in the Los Angeles area, and what happened to the dogs? These are dogs who were bred by the Greyhound racing industry, uh, in many cases, Florida. Uh, They have tattoos in their ears. One can look up their full histories online using those tattoos. Um, In many instances, they ran, and they obviously did not Form as well as their breeders and trainers had wished. And so they were put into Greyhound transport trailers and hauled uh, out to Los Angeles and changed hands and ended up in this facility where there are several buildings full of kennels. Uh, the dogs in those kennels are housed in pairs at best. Some of them are housed alone. Probably 20% of the population at Hemopet are actually kept in crates uh, that are so small that those dogs can barely stand up without having their spine hit the top of that crate. They can barely uh, do something as simple as turn around. And when they lay down and want to stretch out those long legs, it's it's a real challenge uh, for them to do that. Um, one of the most systemic problems at Hemopet that we uncovered is that these dogs, I mean, they're spending 23 or thereabout hours of every single day in these, mm. in these enclosures. They are on very, very hard surfaces and the bedding, if there's anything there, is very, very thin. It's very minimal. And greyhounds have very, very thin skin and they're very prone to pressure wounds and accumulations of 
fluid uh, on their joints and so forth. So a huge number of the population that we saw there had extensive hair loss, had these bulging pockets of water on their elbows, um, had irritation and, and very red, raw-looking skin, um, a lot of mobility problems. You know, very subtle suffering, very subtle cruelty, but very pervasive and endemic. And day in and day out, this was the reality. The other thing that the video does not show, because we could not record audio in California because we comply with the taping law, is that these dogs are barking, howling persistently, uh, very mm. loud. It's an incredibly deafening place. And there's no way for the dogs to escape that. And that is, according to the veterinarians we consulted, an incredibly stressful experience for any dog, let alone greyhounds who are, you know, can be a little bit nervous and anxious and on edge. Um, and so that stress leads to things like pervasive and chronic loose stool. It also just makes them more susceptible. Uh, when they get wounded or when they get sick and they can't fight off, you know, conditions that a healthier dog, a less stressed dog would be able to fend off. All right. So let me get this straight. The dogs come to Hemopet from Florida. They are there to be, well, they say rescued. They're put in crates. They're put in crates. They're, they become sick. The, the wailing is so loud that uh, they, if they're prone to sickness and it's, it, it, it hastens that and also the anxiety level. It, it sounds like a place where they're cramped up and there's no way they can be well. There's no place where they can be. Uh, they can they it's it's no it's no place to live. And then yet this company is sucking their their blood or I mean, they're they're. They're harvesting blood every every ten months. You're saying every ten to fourteen days. Uh, the male ten dogs to fourteen are days. Into the... Ten to fourteen yeah, days. Yeah. So they're yeah. they're like producing blood uh, every two weeks, and then they, they get pumped out. And how many cycles do they go through before they uh, eventually succumb to the environment and you know, and they could produce no more blood that is useful. That goes on. That that's an exhausting cycle, and it goes on for eighteen months or longer, according to the workers there. And then, what happens to the dogs? They they do they die well, then, or? Yeah, no. Then allegedly they're made available for adoption. Only then are they purportedly put up for adoption. Um, but what's interesting about that is that those dogs are put into a particular room, and if a family comes in and says, I want to adopt this particular greyhound. And they do an application, and they meet you know, the requirements of the, of the organization. That adoption then is put on hold uh, for two, sometimes three weeks, mm. until Hemopat can obtain another dog to replace that outgoing animal in the blood-drawing queue. So you can see the priority here is not find these animals homes it's not to rescue these dogs as they claim to be doing and as they rely on to have that non-profit charitable status the priority is as you say to, to suck all that blood out of them and once that has gotten to the point where that dog must move on for, for what remains of that dog's health yeah. um that home that loving home i mean this this is a this could be a six or seven year old dog who has been abused and used for profit by the racing industry and then has been shipped across the country and used and abused again for untold sums of cash by Hemopat. And only then, at long last, does that animal get the chance to be a dog, which obviously he or she deserved the day that they came on this earth. But by then, they're adult, eight-year-old dogs. And what's the average life expectancy of a greyhound? I, I wouldn't imagine it's more uh, than 12 years no. or so. No, no, exactly right. So these are senior animals 
who you know may have a number of health complications. Um, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not prime adoption candidates. They are certainly dogs who come with some very special needs, and you know, obviously, more power to those out there who want to give them homes. But you know, these dogs could very easily, once the racing industry no longer wants them, they could very easily go to an organization like Hemopet, who could adopt them out the day they arrive, the week they arrive, and then ask their guardians, hi, would you bring this dog back three times a year, four times a year? We'll give your dog a free checkup. We'll make sure everything is going all right with the dog's health. And while the dog's here, we'll take the small amount of blood in order to provide it to veterinary clinics for transfusion. Yeah, but instead, the entrepreneurial spirit, the free market takes over, it's for profit, and the dogs are there to service the profit. Well, what happens to the dogs ultimately? Do you have, has anyone tracked what happens when they, when they, their life expectancy once they leave Hemopet? And are, do they have loving homes? And are they able to have a good life after that? Or is it pretty much all downhill once, once they leave Hemopet? Yeah, no, we haven't we haven't been able to see that yet. I mean, I, I can say on the on the plus side, on, on the optimistic side, um, those animals who were released by the Texas Blood Bank when it closed down last fall, we've had the opportunity to meet and interact with some of those dogs, and they have required a lot of rehabilitation, um, both physically and socially, um, but they have been able to be adopted out and they have been able to finally be themselves, you know, to have families and to be able to curl up and run around and have fun. Um, and obviously that's what we want for all these greyhounds. Um, mm -hmm. And it would just, it, it would, it would be better for them and, and, and for the veterinary community at large to, to, to find them those homes. <laughs> the minute that Florida no longer wants them to race, um, yeah. rather than put them through 18 to 24 months of captivity again. Well, what happens now? Uh, PETA exposed this. It's now in the news. Does PETA file a legal complaint? And what do you want to see happen? We filed legal complaints with the California Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, which is the state agency that's charged with regulating and inspecting the facility. And they have opened an investigation uh, we've also submitted the evidence to the local law enforcement agency requesting that they look at potential cruelty violations. And we've also alerted the California Attorney General and the IRS uh, to the discrepancies between the claims that Hemopet makes in trying to raise donations and the reality for the dogs as we expose. Um, really good people can do two things. There, there's two ways to try to try to get at this and prevent this from, from continuing. Um, the first is obviously speaking to one's veterinarian and, and trying to raise mm. this issue and plant the seed with a veterinarian to say, did you know, you know that, that those blood products you purchased from a distributor or from you know, this or that bank, that they come from captive animals and that there is an alternative you know, to, to doing that? And the second thing is, it's the National Greyhound Association that is the largest industry group there. And do they set policies that dictate what happens to their members' dogs when they're no longer wanted for racing purposes? And so we're calling on the National Greyhound Association to bar its members' dogs from ending up captive mm -hmm. in these blood banks and requiring that they just go to a doctor. How does Hemopet respond to all this? What, what do they say? I mean, are, are, are they continuing to... To, to do business while, while all this is happening? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, they, they, they have made no apologies, in fact, really for what they do. Uh, I mean, they will let people in and look at the very captivity that they keep these animals in. Um, they open it to the public. Uh, I, I mean, they, they, in essence, have appeared to hide behind a claim that there is no safe way to provide blood transfusions without having animals in a captive colony. Um, and that's just plainly false. And veterinarians, including at UC Davis, have said as much um, after that claim came out. And when you say captive colony, do you mean 
I mean, are they in the cages, but do they interact at all? Do they, are they able to be social with each other or are they essentially jailed? They're essentially jailed. And, and the few interactions that they actually do have with one another tend to be rather aggressive uh, and dangerous. Uh, we documented a number of instances in which dogs who were kept housed together <clears throat> were incompatible and were fighting and lashing out at each other. Uh, and had to be muzzled uh, in order to be even caged together. Uh, the very few opportunities that there are to go outside of the kennel walls are on these barren concrete pens. And there might be three or four other greyhounds out there, but that's for five minutes, and that's maybe for two or three times a day. It's, it's incredibly minimal uh, socialization opportunity. And so when people see this, I've, I mean, the, does it pass muster? Do, does, do they say, oh, yeah, a human pet looks okay. Let's uh, keep, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong here. Or is should it be fairly obvious that there's something wrong? I think if you know the basic things about dogs and you look at this with an open, honest eye, you know, people would not keep their own dogs, their own beloved companions in conditions like this. And people are rightfully uncomfortable to look at these conditions and think that if they took their dog in for a needed transfusion, that somehow another dog, equally sensitive, equally intelligent, um, would be suffering and, and, and denied so much of what's vital to their happiness and to their health just for that purpose. Um, Dr. Nicholas Dodman, who's a, a professor emeritus of veterinary medicine at Tufts in Massachusetts and probably one of the world's for, uh, foremost canine behaviorists, he wrote a veterinary opinion for us on this. And he said, you know, that, that blood donors should live in homes and not in cages. And it's, it's really that simple. There is an alternative way to help other dogs without keeping these animals in cages. Uh, so extensively and for so long. And with each bank that we expose and with more and more awareness, I think veterinarians see that, guardians see that, regulatory agencies probably are starting to see it. And, you know, it's a long curve and a long shift, but we're moving the ball in that direction. And how many hemopet type operations? I mean, is this the only one they have? And how many blood bank operations that follow this model exists in the United States? Yeah, we're aware of about 12. This is the only hemopat facility that's in operation, but we're aware of about 12, um, and they vary in population. Some have 20 greyhounds. There's one that has approximately 400, um, mm. last count we saw. So whenever someone needs a transfusion or whenever one's pet needs blood at a vet, what are the chances that it's coming from a facility like a hemopet or one of these dog blood banks? Uh, unfortunately, it's very good unless you live very, very close to one of these large veterinary schools that's operating a community blood bank like an NC State or a Penn or a UC Davis. Uh, there is one facility in Colorado that also operates a community bank and that ships uh, blood out uh, to clinics across the U.S. But yeah, I mean, certainly. Hemopet is directly supplying something like 2,000 veterinary clinics. Uh, should people yeah. ask about how their how the blood is sourced if they need a blood transfusion for their pet or for their companion animal at uh, yeah. at, a, at a veterinary situation? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the only way that veterinarians themselves are going to learn about this dark side of of these things that they are just unknowingly order from a distributor. And so it's as simple as saying, where do you source your blood that you're going to put into my dog? You even plant the seed the next time you just go in for a nail trim or for a dental. You know, you say, look, I, I, I learned about this. I had no idea of this. Did you know about this? I sure hope you wouldn't order blood from a place like that. You know, there's an alternative, these community blood banks. I sure hope you would support something like that over a captive colony. All right. So people can go to PETA.org 
and they can see the video that you're in your latest eyewitness case taken by the eyewitness who was inside at Hemopet. This is a story that was reported by Associated Press, big PETA investigation, and they can see all that at PETA.org, Dan? Indeed. It's on the front page, and it will be for several weeks, I'm sure. Yes. All right. Dan, congratulations again on another really uh, important eyewitness case. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you for letting us know about this. I'm sure the the listeners who have brought their their companion animals in for blood transfusions, I'm, I'm sure most of our listeners don't know about this and they need to know about this. So thank you for your good work. Thank you for your kind words and thanks for sharing it with them. Yes. Dan Payden, Director of Evidence Analysis with PETA, on the Hemapet Blood Bank investigation, an eyewitness investigation that uh, was uh, broken by the Associated Press and exposed the cruelty at Hemapet in uh, Orange County, California. See what the eyewitnesses saw in the condition of the greyhounds and get more on avoiding unethical dog blood banks at PETA.org. You can contact us at PETA.org. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's uh, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on amok.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. You can also check us out on, well, wherever you listen to your podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Chromecast, all those different places. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Emil Guillermo.